So welcome back everybody. This is Night Flight and today we are welcoming um, Daniel Christos. <laughs> Excuse me, I all, uh, almost said it the other way around. And um, we are going to talk about, um, yeah, ancient Babylon, the mystery schools, the ancient religion and everything that is connected to it. So Daniel, welcome. Hello, how are you? Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, Daniel, so you are um, here for the first time. So please, can you walk us a little bit through that? I understand that you um, at one point worked for the Coast Guard. So yes. how do you make that transition from Coast Guard to Ballbuster? Okay, so... Uh, I was a Coast Guard back when I was 19. I, I had signed up. I had done a year of college. Wasn't really sure what I was going to do with it. I, I wanted to be a writer. So I was really good in English, really good in history and stuff like that. So my dad suggested, hey, get in the Coast Guard and let them uh, let them take care of the rest of the, uh, the bills on the, going forward for the for the school. And I thought that would have been a good idea. Plus, you know, I could use a little bit more structure in my life so my uh my next step was to go to a recruiter's office and i <laughs> this and this is where the sabotage began um my dad was a telephone tech well he's a um an it at verizon or was until he retired he used to be called new york telephone before they changed to verizon so i wanted to work i thought as i become a writer also have a day job and that would then you to work with my dad you know, at the, at the company. So I asked my recruiter, I told him what I wanted and I told him, and then, you know, it's like, as long as I pass the test and get the high enough score, I want to be able to get into this. And he, he was a TC, which is a, a telecommunications specialist. And he told me that what I wanted to get into was telephone tech and telephone um, telecommunication specialist. There was another rate out there called telephone technician. And that would have been the one that I should have signed up for, but he was going to get more of a bonus because that's the filling. That's, that's the, that's the role that they needed to fill. So he lied to me and I signed up for the wrong thing. And I didn't find this out until halfway through basic training. When I'm looking at the, um, the blue jackets manual, our little book that we get from the coast guards and I'm reading the descriptions of the rates and I'm like, Whoa, wait a minute there. And I tried to bring it up to them and they're like, you should be grateful you're getting a guaranteed rate when you get out, blah, 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 blah. And they maybe do a bunch of push-ups and uh, that they call punish you, right? And then when I got to the boat, after getting out of school, I was in the Astoria, Oregon. And um, I had asked, is it possible for me to go to the other school? And they just kept on denying, denying, denying. So I was like, all right, whatever. It's a tele it's a top secret clearance job. It's tele it's telecommunications. It's like being a radio man, though, not telephone technician. So that kind of was a lead up to doing podcasts and radio shows and stuff like that. So, I mean, I did get some of that in there. I had to handle all the message traffic during nine eleven. We were in Mexico at the time. We were called back onto our boat, but as soon as I did uh, see the message traffic, it was all Z flash rating messages which is like the highest priority you have to rush it to them within five minutes and um my my position basically made it so that i had direct contact most people don't they go through their other people to get up to the captain but i i had a you know one-to-one -one relationship going straight to the captain or the officer of the watch handing them the message traffic so that was one unique uh aspect of what i did so and i had to have toxic clearance so Mm -hmm. So I have to <laughs> He's cool. blocking the camera. <laughs> so um, in a very lovely um, synchronicity, today I read an article that was titled, If you want to understand the globalists, you must understand their psychopathic religion. Would you agree with that statement? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Their psychopathic religion is very ancient and it's where we get ideas like eugenics and transhumanism from as well. The perfected man, the secular humanist, this all comes from 
Mishri Babylon into the Freemasonic order into many of the other offshoots of that. When people talk about the Illuminati too, they, people like it, it overdo it. So it's like almost sounding like cliche to me. I even hate hearing the word, but if you read books like um, Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robeson from 1795, he was a Freemason and he witnessed firsthand the infiltration between not only the Jesuits, but also the Illumin ones from Adam Weishaupt and others. There was other offshoots called the Philadelphies and Philoleths were another one. And these, these orders, they had many different names. So when they shut down the one in Bavaria and they vacated Adam Weishaupt from his position, that wasn't the end of it. They had already infiltrated all the other lodges. They just either had no name or they had a different name, like the Ami Regis or Ami Reunis. I'm sorry. That was another name that they went by, but they just kept on going. And when they back in, well, let's see, right in the 1780s area, that's when um, you had Adam Weissop. Jacob Frank, and this is the one person that they forget about in the room when they have this meeting, right? With Meyer Amschel Rothschild, they basically incorporated the 17 Frankist ideas and goals into the Illuminati's structure, right? So Jacob Frank became a, a wealthy man overnight. This is all in Frankfurt where this happened. You have, and I'm sure you probably like, uh, what's it, Frankfurt on the Main? That was basically the same, that, that area. And let's see, Meyer Amschel Rothschild converted to Frankism. So when they call him a Z, they're basically talking about Frankism. And when you learn what Frankism is, you can understand the true nature of that word, the other one that they modern use in modern times. So it's, it's about pushing the hand, forcing the hand of God not letting God do things on his own time. If this is even his plan, this is just their assumed plan and creating the uh, conditions for the redemption or the, uh, the return, right? The return of their Messiah, their Messiah. Let's not confuse things. <laughs> and um, let's not assume that they're talking about the same person here. So they decided long ago, Isaac Luria, through his writings and his his, his uh, disciples and stuff like that, who actually gathered his papers and made it into a Kabbalah after his death. It wasn't like Luria was writing a Kabbalah. It was what they did with his paperwork after it. They uh, determined that it's way easier to corrupt everybody than it is to make everybody good. So there's the two, uh, the two avenues to the same goal. So they wanted to corrupt everyone by blood, meaning tainting them like shots, if you will, and by degradation and erosion of morality. They wanted to destroy all positive forms of, and systems. So all positive religions, all positive forms of government, and the family was their biggest target. And if you, you can look around and see what, where they're going with that and how effective they've been so far. And even mm -hmm. tragedy by itself, like if you're harming a child and they get some kind of damage from some sort of procedure that they get from an allopath that destroys the family too. And now they're working, uh, you know, they're, they're, one of them is going to have to be home all the time to take care of the injured child while the other person, it just, it just breaks things up, right? It, may, it causes tragedy, living or, or death. It's just not good. And it's very evil, very evil. Yeah. Um, what you just said, targeting uh, the family just today, I read two articles that the Senate of Berlin, in Berlin they have a Senate, <laughs> um, mm. yeah, they decided to put sex rooms uh, into kindergartens for three-year-olds so that they can um, have a safe space to explore their own bodies or maybe with another child at three years old yeah and there's not a there's not pitchforks and tiki torches and people storing the castle and looking for heads we, we will see they there was something similar 
but um, the parents were outraged and then that project was dropped. We will see where it goes. This is, as far as it is now, it is their idea and we will see um, yeah, what is the outcome of this. Yeah, that's a very fr yeah, that's a very frankest thing as well. The perversions. That's one of the main. If if oh, so the outline, you know, you're talking about the dark dark beliefs and religions. This is coming out in the mystery schools, but it kind of got a revival through Luria, through Sabotage Zevi, and through Jacob Frank. So that's what I'm focusing at because this is when it was actually proclaimed in straightforward language, and not hidden masked by some other type of thing that they've infiltrated. So uh, incest, the corruption of children. So if you know what I mean, just what, just what you just said, um, sodomy, drinking of blood, eating of flesh, human, of course, ritual uh, orgies, wife swapping, but the consumption of children was one of the big things there. And it was these are called duties of a Frankist. And if you look around and you've ever heard anything about how they classify the quote unquote they or the quote unquote elites, this is what they do, right? This is what we've heard them, you know, the blood drinking, the child sacrifice, all that stuff. This can be this can be mirrored by what they what a Frankist would say is your duty to do. And when you start to realize that people like the Rothschilds had converted to that, and you know their strength and their stronghold and their manipulation of just about everything you know even even the even blackrock wouldn't be blackrock if it wasn't for the rothschild money propping it up you can understand like this is this is widespread so if it manifests as this thing or that thing or the z word just understand that this is frankism you know and this is what we're really saying it's basically satanism it, it, if you're trying to conceive of it in those terms it's very babylonian and very cult of ball and cult of Sybil type of things because they like to change the genders. They like to castrate the males. It's it's all very strange stuff. Hmm. Yeah. So let's uh, circle back a little bit to um, ancient Babylon. Yeah. You write in your book that um, ancient man uh, and the worship of celestial body as an expression of divine essence would you is that for you that they thought the celestial bodies were gods or just an expression how do you see that so i think so here when i when i when i examine that i think there's a missing piece of the puzzle that we don't have and i honestly think that i mean there may have been guidance there that we're not talk we're not talked to about. So if there was living beings that let's say they survived a cataclysm, they might appear as gods to them because their technology was never interrupted, whereas everybody else was reduced back to primitive times and had to be retaught things like agriculture, you know, community and all this other stuff in writing and all that. So they could have appeared to be gods, but it seems like the story, no matter what culture you're going into, it's these people showed up, they were tall most of the time. They, you know, if you if you don't have a a uh, foundation for or a um, frame of reference for something and you see a boat and you've never seen a boat before, I mean that even that could be like fantastic to you, right? And if they liked high places, who knows? Maybe they did have something that could move about in the air. You know, the, like they always talk about the 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 worship of high places, most high. Why is it ship worship? There you go. Exactly. Very interesting, right? So I think that might be a missing piece of the puzzle, but celestially, I think there's energies that happened, you know, during these certain times that people witnessed over time. Or they were taught this. Or it's or it's because they were taught this. Because if they didn't, you know, have a concept of boat, how intricate of a thought is that of this star moving here or you know granted they didn't have tv and they didn't sit inside a lot but that's a lot of observation over a long period of time to know when things are going to happen around us and cycle again so for that to be already a not like a knowledge base back, back then 
for this uh this astro astrological type of religion i think that they were taught this mostly and also i think that there may have been some other thing that happened during a cataclysm that was very obvious that was witnessable like they talk about saturn being bright at one time and um the transformation that occurred there and so a lot of things could have been and saturn is chronos is time it is satan if you want to if you want to call it that and time is the most you know they call it the most illusory aspect to all things and the cube like why does a cube have anything to do with saturn there's a lot of questions here but the cube is representative of saturn right and you can get into the ancient ge geometry and the, the mystery schools and that too did i answer the question i don't know <laughs> why, do, why, why do i think they did that or how did they get to that i don't know how they got to it no i i, I was aiming at do you think that the ancients really believed the celestial objects were gods or just an expression of divine essence i think i think they utilized that for the, so this i think it was a control mechanism actually i think it was a priesthood a priestcraft who would tell them these things and then they could point to something to that they could observe and that would if they could predict it then they were in touch with the gods quote unquote and i think yeah. that's how they manipulated the the masses into uh subjugation because i think this is where classes class systems first kind of like came about was once a priesthood you know self self proclaimed their superiority over others and then they kept priest kings and things of that nature but it was this religiosity that that came up out of that and it was basically mostly astrology back then and then mm. you know phenomenons in nature being able to keep a fire going you know the 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 the, uh, the initiates of the flame that type of stuff mm. so many people have a little bit of a problem imagining that <laughs> you can over such a long period of time uh follow an idea your your ideal whatever but i think what they usually do not think of is the priest class mm -hmm. and um, so can you walk us a little bit through that why the priest class is really a point that we need to understand that holds it together over centuries right so I think there's an ancient trauma that may have occurred during a cataclysm. And when fear is at its high and it imprints a big dent into your, D into your DNA and your, in your collective memory, like they call like the monarch effect, I think the need for something greater than yourself to feel protected and secure is out there. And it's, and it's, it's just like if you run to your parent when something scary happens in the nighttime or something, you know, and you have a bad dream. It's that feeling, but it's manipulated by these this priesthood. And even if they weren't the kings, because there's a lot of priest kings out there, I, I believe Nimrod was considered one of them. If if Nimrod was a, was even a thing, because Nimrod might have been Sargon of Akkad, it could have been some other person that they were talking about. And Nimrod could have been a title, doesn't necessarily mean an actual person. It could have been like Tsar. Um, and then you had, um, why well, I said Sargon of Akkad, but you had, uh, there was a lot of people in this, in the Assyrian occupation of Babylon that were priest kings. So even if they weren't them, they were the advisors and they still are today. The advisors to the king, the whispering in the air because the religion dictated your divine right to rule. So if you weren't the the, the priest king itself and the the head of the church if you will or the head of the 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 cult or the religion or the belief system, then you had advisors who you couldn't really go against because the people were on their side because it was their religion and they were just as manipulated. I mean, if you, how crazy does it have to get before you and how desperate do you have to be to think that you need to please your gods by sacrificing your child in a furnace? I mean, it's, if that, that's a pretty good manipulation by a priest of craft, because I, even when you look at the Ugaritic texts for the ball cult, there's nothing talking about that stuff in there. That's the priesthood interpret interpreting what you need to do to please the gods. So it's it's the priesthood that's making this stuff evil. It's not even so much the the written word of these epics, of these tales. It's 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 somewhat showing that there's war like people like, um, I think it's Asherah or 
a star there. One of the they, one of the uh, the cohorts of uh, of Ball, she had a bloodlust for his enemies, but she was also his protector. So just like if somebody was threatening your king or your president, you would have a bloodlust for getting rid of the, his, their detractors as well, especially if they were plotting against him. So you could understand that, like maybe she reveled in the blood a little bit, but there was nothing talking about children. There's nothing talking about burning them and you know burnt offerings. This all came from the priesthood and from their, <clears throat> seems to be from their minds. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, I I understand that. On the other hand, I have to say I I, I don't really know when uh, this uh, Baal character lost. Yeah, let's say his uh, position of prominence. <laughs> I don't but, know if he did. Yeah, I, I, in that sense, yes. And today, I mean, many people are diving back into that entire history because they finally uh, get it that it is important to understand it. But I have to say, if anybody would promote... Um, child sacrifices in my name i would be furious i would jump out of my skin so where's mm -hmm. the, we have anything where baal reacted to that you know if, if they would probably since the interpretations are manipulated by the priesthood who interprets what goes on around them even if they had a plague if they had a, a famine if they had war it would all be because they didn't please the gods enough and they would require more sacrifices of the same. It wouldn't be because of the sacrifice. See, mm -hmm. they get they they control how the how the stuff is interpreted. That's that's but the perfect Baal position. Corrected that. Well, I mean, if Baal was was a deity and it came before, then it's all about the story. It's not really about the. I mean, are you talking about an actual character? Because Baal Marduk was Baal could also be just mean Lord, but it did mean one specific person as well. So a lot of times there's like there's Baal Hadad, which is more most likely who they're talking about. Um, there's Baal Marduk, who is uh, Enki's son, basically. And there's, I mean, these these people could be mythological prior to man because Enki and Enlil apparently created man after Marduk's um, destruction of Tiamat. That that was the after effect of that Kingu and Tiamat. So. Whether or not they were around or not, I don't know. But the priests would basically take on the persona of these characters during the rituals. So it's still being controlled by the priests, you know what I mean? So they're never going to throw themselves under the bus. It's, it's, they're, they have complete control over, over their flock. Well, personally, to me, when I read texts like that, there is, uh, for my taste, other people might see that differently. Uh, but for my taste, there are too many um, personality traits in it. A um, human, right? Human personality uh, traits. So, so that I cannot really say, "Oh, this is just a myth. This is right. this never happened." So, I think we did deal with uh, entities, whatever they were. I leave that open, and. Um, but on the other hand, it is possible that Baal, maybe at that point when the priest class corrupted uh, everything, maybe he was already gone or he was yeah. already dead. Yeah, and I have a theory about that too, because I think in the absence of, so this is what I, I think there was an actual physical or witnessed somehow experienced interaction with something that they perceived as gods regardless of what it was if it was entities if it was just people with high technology who then went underground after they were done getting you know civilization upstarted again um and there's there's talks about this too and they're they talk about the the vril uh people from underneath the ground who one day when uh, they get, it gets too crowded they're gonna destroy everybody on the earth and, and reclaim it that's that's goes through the mystery schools as well, and that's uh, part of the Theosophical Society and all that other ideas. But what I think happens is, in the absence of those deities, once they're gone, they have like a desperation type of attempt to 
bring that back by doing these types of sacrifices and they get more and more severe the more desperate they are like if you look in uh like the aztec and mayan area like they were skidding people alive they were pulling out their hearts and burning them they were doing all the stuff that it, it was uh like a de-evolution de of the loss of their gods so it just got more and more extreme the longer they were apart from their deities or whatever it okay. seemed like there's like an abandonment issue type of thing where they were desperately trying to get them back with all these types of acts and performances and stuff to get them and if, and if magic is a thing and i believe it is certain things will work to show some kind of energetic response so when they did that they're like ooh, and they did some more and it got more and more in, in, intense and you know the end result is drinking blood eating flesh and killing babies you know it's, it's mm -hmm. weird stuff yeah so you uh, also say in your book that the serpent represented the entire body of the priest prop. Or the I think that was something that uh, I think that's something that Bill Cooper said in the book, because oh, it was okay. a, it was a quote of his. The, yeah, the, the body of the priestcraft, meaning the whole of of all the priesthoods of all the of all the uh, orders, not like head to toe, but like the the collection of the of the beliefs. Do you have any idea how he came to that conclusion? The serpent energy, the wisdom, they're, they're always talking about the intellect with these uh, secular humanists, like man can become God. So, and again, this could be an after effect of losing uh, touch with their actual deities. It could be like, well, then we don't need them anymore type of feeling where it's like, well, man can become God because why would they leave us here by ourselves? You know, that, that could have been, you know, if not expressed in those words, maybe that was the feeling. And you have uh, like the ideas of the, the serpent in the garden, how he represented. And I got, you know, this is something I haven't shared with anybody yet because I just kind of had this click in my head uh, yesterday when I was reading something. So you have the tree of life. And I know this is probably allegorical for most part. It could be just really symbolic and encrypted, some kind of asatiric thing where it has a real definite defining meaning behind it. But as a literal thing, it doesn't sound like you're talking about talking snakes here. But the tree of life and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So you could think of the tree of life as truth because in, in different, uh, what do you call it? Uh, religions they actually do have the a similar thing and then it is a tree of truth it's actually in babylon a tree of truth and a tree of truth of uh, knowledge or something like that so if the knowledge of good think about it this way if it was knowledge of good pause and evil so it wasn't it wasn't just knowledge of good and evil in that you didn't know one or the other it was knowledge of good and evil that they weren't supposed to because the tree, tree of truth or the tree of life was good. And you knew that. You knew what good was. You didn't have to know what evil was. And of course, truly, surely you will die. Because in order for you to know evil, you'd have to experience it. So that's when death comes in. So the, the, this idea, and, and you could represent the uh, knowledge of good and evil as the, know the knowledge of magic, introducing magic because of the dark practices involved. Uh, and the, the forbidden and, and also there's a lot of talk out there that the, the fruit of the tree they were talking about the tree being like the, the essence of man and the fruit would be their children and you weren't supposed to eat your children and this is something that they practice because there's never an apple this is something that was added there's you know it's not, the, it's not it never it never said apple oh, no. right exactly that comes from paintings <laughs> mm -hmm. comes from dante all that kind of stuff yeah exactly i don't know if it's dante itself but it may have been milling yeah so, so um <laughs> oh my god my goodness i i it's, just, it's, I just it's, went it's, black <laughs> no it's okay i i think i kind of left it a, a little bit of a hanger anyway like um so so the serpent being the wisdom right because that's what they're saying it is. I don't think that's true. I think like he's bringing knowledge, but what what does that really mean? It's not just knowledge. You're 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 cutting it short there. It's knowledge of good and evil, and that uh, curiosity 
it's almost like curiosity killed the cat, right? Knowing, knowing more and saying that that's some kind of knowledge. Like when I look at empirical knowledge that you get from books from, from a college or a tech, you know, textbooks, that's not, that's not what I would consider knowledge. That's what I would consider empirical knowledge where you're, you're just learning without questioning a bunch of quote unquote facts so that you can repeat them and have a, you know, a star on the board because you're such a good boy, you have a good memory. But if you actually analyze some of the stuff that you get in a book and you try to, you know, put it to the test, you're going to find out that a lot of it isn't true, especially about mm -hmm. science, because eugenics and transhumanism has been guiding science since Darwin before that. Yeah. Show us the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have I have a bunch of tabs in it right now, but that's a, and that's, mm -hmm. that's William Cooper right there. I, I use some of his, uh, the hour of the time broadcast because I like, had him introduce some of the topics it's been 20 something years since he passed away he was well he was murdered in 2001 so yeah. i wanted to introduce him to a new generation and then kind of remind people of our old friend who didn't know who he was and you know he's also the author of behold the pale horse and i, th I see a lot of people right now they are they need to raise their standards when it comes to what they call quote unquote patriot or quote unquote the word i hate because it's not a real word truther um like like the like the alex jones and the and the and the stu peters of the of the world they are they don't they're not half the honest sincere person family man that this guy was and i think that they need to raise their standards because none of those people would ever tell you to listen to everybody read everything believe absolutely nothing until you can prove it in your own research not even me they don't want you to question they don't want you to consider questioning them they are trying to guide you and that's a big yeah. difference between them and Bill. Yeah, that is so true. And but they are very, very popular. And I'm not saying that they do not get anything, but basically, to me, it's regurgitating. Um, oh my god! News with um, yeah, a, a critical spin on it. Not and yes. But of course, that is very popular and they have thousands and thousands of subscribers. But that is not what I want to do because there is another layer. Yeah, and you know, a lot of that, a lot of, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that they manipulate too. You can man manipulate numbers so that people think it's more popular and people always want to be at the cool kids table. It's just a mentality thing for people who don't think for themselves. They want to, they want to, the way the way they do their this you know discernment is, well, if this many people are following them, then it must be something I can just watch without having to think too much about it, right? Because they must be right. Because I mean, look at all these other people. So they can they can fudge the numbers in the beginning. They can give you all the publicity because if they want to make you something, if they're promoting you, it's gonna look like you you got everything going for you even before you do. It's fake it till you make it type of stuff, right? And then once you do you're off and running because everybody else is already like, like moths to a flame. They're already there. You know, they're, they're coming in droves because they saw the big, the big numbers and the high priced, you know, production and all this other stuff. People who have a, like truth in mind, don't make anything. They're not going to have high production. They're not going to have all this stuff unless someone's purposely pushing them forward. It's, it's not going to, or you're independently wealthy and you're doing it as a hobby, but you're losing money. You're not, you're not making it. You know? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And uh, to the uh, conclusion that if so many people are listening, it must be good. I only can say we have seen in 2020 that that is not always correct. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because the masses didn't get it. Right. No, they did not. Yeah. <clears throat> it's pretty sad, so, but uh, what can be done... Yeah to people just based on the pressure of, or, or the assumed pressure of what they think they should do or what they think is expected of them to the point where they're not even sure why they have to go do this thing, but they'll lose their job or they'll lose favor with other people around them or they won't be able to go see their grandparents on Thanksgiving if they don't get this thing because of the, <laughs> that they told us about. Right. So you got to, Get that thing in the arm. 
It's ridiculous. Yeah. The Jamba Jews. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. There you go. If you don't have your Jamba Jews, you cannot enter here. <laughs> <laughs> The Jim Jones Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have to address something that I have never heard before. Uh, I wrote it down: Isis feeding her child with a finger instead of her breast, and put him every night into a fire to render him immortal. How can you render somebody immortal by putting him into a fire? Uh, renewal. Yeah, that's what the immortality of it is. But that was again, that was from a bill broadcast because that was that. So the stuff that I was gonna just glot like um enough to just have mentioned it, but my like my my research focus was on other stuff. Like I let Bill fill in that stuff. So at least you know the train because he did this mystery school thing, uh, mystery Babylon series of like forty two parts. And he covered a lot of this stuff. So I used bits and pieces of it here and there. And then one called the darkness. And I believe that's where that one comes from is the darkness broadcast. And yeah, it's, it's, it's all cryptic, right? So it's not, it's not the direct straightforward, literal translation of it. It's what these words mean to them at that particular time in that particular cultural, you know, setting all things that we can't just assume because they're not like us and they weren't there, but the, the flame was considered a renewal. And also they utilize uh, the symbol of the flame for, uh, for, for knowledge, just like Prometheus, right? With the, with the uh, bringing fire to man. And also that things were, when you, when you cleansed things with fire, like your enemies, if you will, then they couldn't come back for you. And that's a Babylonian thought of the fear of the dead and the retaliation of the dead. Because they had so many incantations for any, even if they were good people while they were alive. If when they died, they assumed that this force or this entity was going to terrorize their family, which is so weird, right? Like, why would you think like grandpa's going to terrorize the family now? But they were so strongly in belief of this, which makes me wonder what they were actually doing during their life. Um, that they had all kinds of different spells and stuff like that to keep this thing out of the house and get it, get it away from the town and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and, but so the fire was supposed to prevent that as well. Hmm. Um, this priesthood, including um, the cabal that is uh, still practicing it. Um, would you say that the ultimate goal of the polytheist is to get rid of all moral constraints and mm -hmm. determine itself um, by themselves what is uh, good, what is evil, and in that way becoming God? Yes. A uh, couple things with that. Getting rid of all positive systems like we had talked about before. Mm -hmm. uh, can sets the conditionings for what they consider would be the redemption, which means the Messiah returning, most people getting annihilated, but not them because of the special boys who made it happen, right? So, or the, I don't want to say that, well, they're not really the chosen either because they, they were at odds with Jews as well. You know, they got, they were heretical Jews who didn't follow much of anything, right? Zoharists is one time uh, what they had called themselves. So, or, Kabbalists. So um, the whole, you're asking, like, do you think that'll help them become as gods because of their, uh, you know, determining right and wrong? That's, if, that's if something that... that I think the AI is actually going to be for, because if you look into what they were talking about decades upon decades ago, which makes me wonder if AI is, is something new or if it's an ancient thing that just, it's like a relic from the past that teaches these mystery school people who find who find an artifact and then they create secrecy around it to build up such uh, civilization again so that they can bring it back online and maybe ai is like a demonic force or presence and it's just what comes through the electricity or whatever i don't know but it's really weird because i mean we're talking about in the 60s and 70s they were talking about a computer system that they wouldn't want it to have to run everything through to tell them what to do. And then they would, without any thinking, do it. 
this is like this is how the jesuits are supposed to operate they're not supposed to have any individual input on anything they're just supposed to be tools to, that are that are directed and guided right that's how all of these clandestine operations are supposed to operate and the pope and all the they were they were talking about this this computer system they were just going to spit it out so that would be their god in essence right and they would just tell us what they tell them and then right yeah, that reminds me of uh, Jordi Rose when he stood next to the uh, quantum computer. He said, "It is as if you are standing next to God." Oh. Yeah. Uh, uh, nice, uh, nice way of uh, kind of softballing that into somebody's collective, you know, their uh, their subconscious, right? That it's because it's supposed to be smarter than us. So in essence, it's going to be at least superior to us, if not quote unquote God, right? They're not going to mm -hmm. say, I, I'm, I'm sure they're not going to be uh, trying to be too in, uh, invasive or, or uh, abrasive to those who are still religious because they want everybody to kind of like, the, the way they do things so gradually, it's it's without you noticing, like boiling the frog type of thing so that it's already happened before and it's before you notice it, it's too late for most of the stuff that goes on. Mm. I have um, one guest. Um, his name is Aloba Jones, and uh, he lives in Australia, and he is an exorcist. Oh, wow. And, uh, but he is not connected to any church. And he has a group of international people. They are doing um, astral sessions. And they actually uh, go and destroy stuff that is harming us here. Just so did... recently, they they took down a loose grid, and um, so they, it has not been published yet. But um, he said in our last interview that in one of their last sessions that they did together they encountered a galactic AI that came from a different galaxy and invaded here. And that galactic AI cannot understand things like man, woman, child. Yeah, And he said that is part of the reason why everything in... Um, these terms, you know, male, female, everything is going down the crapper now because the this galactic AI has no freaking clue what to do with that. Uh, that's interesting. But it should be a learning system, too, that would have a frame of reference to it at some point if it's trying to understand us, you know, so that it yeah, can maybe manipulate it, us. It, it isn't. Maybe it just uh, wants to, yeah. Dominate. It, 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 yeah, not only dominate, but uh, make us like it. Mm, like the Borg. Yeah. Yeah. The Borg collective there. You know, that's interesting because I, when I look at these, I go off in these uh, thought exercises a lot. And to me, I have a, this sense that there's this idea of the of the dichotomy of uh, you know heaven and hell, God and the devil, but I always think that there's a third thing that threatens both of them, and I, this is just a feeling that I've had that it's it's alien in the sense that it's not from either of the two things that allegedly have created everything here, but it's still a threat and it's a threat to both of them. And when we reject fully our protection, which would be the aggressive force of the bad guy in red then we let our guard down so we can't defend ourselves against the thing that's really threatening both of us it's mm -hmm. just a weird thing to ponder i don't know if it's got anything to it but certain movies and th certain themes that i've that i've seen make me think that that's being expressed and i always have this idea that you know no matter what story you tell you can't get away from story telling the story is expressive through that it whatever how cryptically it becomes like even like love stories or songs and stuff like that. That's like the great divorce, the, the separation of the two, the two, um, you know, I guess uh, philosophical <laughs> points of view there. Um, 
and uh, that I'm not saying I'm not saying a unification is what we is what we would want at all, but it makes me think that there's a third man in the room, and that thing, or you know, man being a metaphor here, in that it threatens everything. I don't know. That's possibility. Yeah, I I I wouldn't count it out. Of course, both of us we cannot prove it at right. this point, but I would not dismiss it right away. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about Edmund. What is his oh, name? Oh, Rene. Yeah. Yeah, Rene. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah, so that, that chapter. Uh, the Freemasonic link to uh, Babylon. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can find the actual quote that I wanted to show you. So, because I I found that interesting that Freemasonry. Um, many people think it's a newer uh, invention, but it also goes back way, way back. Well, the mystery schools do, and here's what I think happens too, because they did the same thing with the Rosicrucians, right? Mm. They will claim in order to get legitimacy, they will claim ancient roots, so or or very significant time, uh, you, know, you know, events as being something that has been carried on, so that they can say that they have, you know, they have the um, hidden knowledge or whatever. So I so I would question the Templar uh, claim. That Templars had anything to do with the Freemasons, or that they somehow are carrying on any of that information. I question that. I question what would be passed off as a Rosicrucian these days, because I think that that's something that was done in the 1600s, and anyone who claims it after that is just using it for clout. Because I don't think they have actually had the information or are pursuing it in the prop in the same way that they would be if they were true Rosicrucians, like the Francis Bacon's of the world and stuff like that. Um, especially more modern ones after the late 1700s and on, I don't think they were, they were true Rosicrucians, the Rosy Cross. Um, but yeah, so with Edmund Ronane, he was, uh, he was very well respected, well regarded Freemason. He was writing basically not so much textbooks, but like the, the guidebooks to Freemasonry, how you're supposed to act, what's the, you know, the, 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 the mannerisms, the the rituals, the the ceremonies—I should say, not the rituals—and um, the handshakes, the types, this, all this stuff that the structure that was somewhat missing and somewhat spotty, that was filled in, like during the the um, French Revolution, before prior to that era, there was a lot of different things added to Freemasonry to bolster, bolster it up, but also. You get more. I think there's also a financial thing there, where if you get more um, degrees, then there's more fees for initiations <laughs> into these degrees. So I think that because like they went, they expanded from like three to four to forty five of them in the French lodge, and everybody's like, oh, thirty third degrees at the top. That's Scottish Rite Freemasonry, and the Blue Lodge Freemasonry, the English Lodge. That's three. It's the it's the three, right? Um, so Vermaine was kind of looking through the old archives and doing a bunch of research and he was piecing things back together and trying to like restore what he thought was, you know, free Freemasonry. And they like to claim Egypt a lot. They like to, they like to claim that as like substantiating. And that's another one of those things I think that they do because it's for clout. I mean, there might be something to it. I think they might carry on some of the, the practices of mystery Babylon. Absolutely. But as far as like there being a direct tie, I don't know if there is. I think they just adopt it. Like um, the the what do they call it the Egyptian revival occurred in the Victorian era. That's when like they rediscovered everything and like they were doing on mummy tours and mummy unwrappings and all this other stuff. And it was huge in England and stuff like that. Uh, so that's when these orders started claiming a lot more Egyptian roots because uh, that was the craze, right? So Edmund Ronain, like I had said, he was he wrote a book called The Master's Carpet or Maha Bone. It just the name Maha Bone is supposed to be like this uh, secretive word that most Freemasons don't know the name of, or don't don't know the, the definition of, but you're not even supposed to speak it to a, a non-Freemason. They're not even supposed to know that. So for him to title his book that, or the, or the Master's Carpet, uh, was basically his uh, his thumb to the nose of 
of the order because he got dis he got disillusioned when he was doing his research. And in one particular part, and I'll see if I can get to it. So the, the book was written in 1879. And that's also the year Margaret Sanger was born. <laughs> um, let's see. So here's here's what he says. He says, Freemasonry is far too serious a matter for any man to assume its villainous obligations without due reflection. For once you have crossed the threshold of the lodge room, divested your own clothing and wearing the habiliments of the order, and when once you become, as it were, bound to the cable toe of Satan to the altar of Baal, there is no place after for after repentance. Though like Esau of old, you may seek it carefully with tears. Living or dead, Freemasonry will never give you up. The law of Romanism is once a priest, always a priest. And so it is in Freemasonry. Once a Mason, always a Mason. And there's 55 references to Ball in total and the Master's Carpet. And he's basically saying this is the cult of Ball in disguise. This is what we're worshiping. This has nothing to do with like an old, you know, uh, in the 17, late 1700s, they were claiming, the Illuminati was claiming in their in the lodges that they controlled as far as Freemasonry, that they had the real Christianity, even though it was their design to destroy Christianity and all forms of religion, save their own. Um, they were saying that they had the, the true mysteries of, of Christianity. So they're trying to bring Christians in and then a few degrees later, tell them that that was a lie and tell them that the, the deeper truth is this other thing, but they were already, you know, invested for so much, uh, that was it was uh trying to basically turning christians into anti-christians you know it was pretty interesting stuff mm -hmm. so uh, when when those i mean we have uh lodges all over the world in egypt in mm -hmm. even muslim country and that, yeah egypt is a muslim country but even other muslim countries and um so in essence, what I hear is you can keep your religion on the surface, but once you enter into the lodge or wherever you are meeting, all that falls away and everybody is on the same page and they have a totally different religion. Yeah, you know, I think in the, the lower degrees, I don't think that any of this is even applicable. Like, I think there's people that are just, you know, it's the same thing as going to like the Elks Lodge or like, you know, a Rod and Gun Club. I don't think there's anything really all that, you know. No, of course not. That that would be what we call porch masonry. Yeah, but when you get up a little bit higher, that that's when things are, you know, you might get tapped on the shoulder and at, at that point, like Ronane himself was at a very high level. So from his perspective, this whole thing is a, is, a, is a mess because he knows what even the people are on the very lowest level, their efforts and their energy is being used to do something harmful to mankind. So even at that level, they're participating in evil. You know, so even if it's at, a, at the lowest level of, of their own understanding of it, they might think they're doing good. They might be thinking they're helping their fellow man. But in all reality, there's a much bigger purpose that's being served. And the higher up you go, the more you know about that purpose. Uh, let's see. So this is this is another line that he says. He says, um, an architect is a man who furnishes plans for and superintends the erection of a building made for from material already prepared, already prepared. But God created of nothing the heavens and the earth and all the host of them, and hence he cannot be a mere architect, and it would be a direct insult to call him such a nickname. And what he's referring to is what the Freemasons call the great architect of the universe. So he's saying, well, that wouldn't be God because God creates. He doesn't just assemble with things that are already created. And he said, yeah. well, and, that, and that's the difference. So there's, no, there's got to be something different about what the – 
Freemasons are, you know, genuflecting to and uh and and worshiping. Which I found pretty interesting. Uh <laughs> he goes into some really like he 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 puts he puts a lot of uh it, it's it's written like it's supposed to be like this really long letter to his son, but it's I think it's contrived. Like it's just it's, he's writing a book, but he's doing it in that like type of format, like that formula. So he's trying to convince his son not to not to follow his path. And in a in essence, it's kind of like his way of uh, repenting and trying by trying to save another innocent life from walking into the the wrong thing. Because I think he even thinks that he's. He went super Christian after that. He went super uh, deep into fighting them for quite a while, but I think he was the whole time he was he was looking for forgiveness for what he had done, not knowing. So uh, being tricked. Uh, yeah, I think he he died on his uh on the without uh they 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 still they still trash his name today, and they they downplay it. The first thing you know, the best thing to do is not to say how devastating your opponent is. It's just to be like. Like if you get whacked in the face, you get knocked out. Be like, ah, that would barely, barely even felt it. You know what I mean? That's that's the type of hubris people would have in order to downplay what happened. But I think he gave him a pretty good a good shot. It may have uh, disrupted them for a while. And this this was his the Chicago Lodge. So many things happen in Illinois. Like you have the corrupt and evil president uh, Lincoln coming out of there. We can talk about this one time. That was a whole big can of worms there, but. A lot of stuff happens in Chicago, and right now it's a cesspool. It's a you know, if you like to get shot, you should go to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, higher opportunity, higher chance to do that. This was the public hour for full access of the entire interview. Please join our Patreon community. Thank you.